you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. And we're going to begin reading in verse 9. 1 Kings chapter 17, and beginning in verse 9. The Bible says, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I might drink. And as he was going to fetch, and as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, a, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel, and a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast, as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after that make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went, and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and her house did eat many days. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this holy book. Lord, we thank you for the insight it gives us to your character and to just the things that happen to us in a daily way. Lord, we praise you for that. We pray now that you bless it to the hearts of the hearers and we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it. For it's in Christ's name that I do pray. Amen. I'll be, I'll be preaching this morning on the thought when you're scraping the bottom, of the, the bottom of the barrel. Now, a lot of us have not had times like that. Some of us have when literally, and you know, back then, I, I, I'm old enough to remember this, where you had them old big tin cans that Lord came in, and women would stare their, store their flour and their cornmeal in them barrels. And you go there, your mama might say you get a cup of flour, you go there, open it up, bring it to her. And that's kind of what they had here. They bought in supply that would last. Now, uh, you know, the Lord will give us a supply, and I'm not just talking about food, I'm talking about spiritual things that will last. But sometimes we get down to scraping the bottom of the barrel. And, you know, we seem to look at that with a little shame. But listen, remember this. You're sustained by the bottom of the barrel. Sometimes it's a good thing to hit the bottom of the barrel. It will teach you what God we serve. Now, what we like in the flesh is lots and lots of money and lots and lots of stuff. But does it teach you anything? And I'd have to say no. Because you know what? When we get lots of stuff and we get lots of money, who do you rely on? Well, you rely on yourself. And so we see then, very much in a spiritual sense, the same can be applied. Now, you know the story of Elijah here, and he pronounced a, a drought uh, because of the sin uh, uh, of the king and queen, he uh, pronounced a drought on the land, and God sent a drought, and I want you to know that God's man suffered too. Somehow in the modern day, there's this false teaching that we're exempt because we're Christians. You know, we live in a nation that is ungodly and has an ungodly leader and has filth in, the, in, in all its realms, 
and we're surprised that it costs 30 bucks to buy a roast today? I'm not surprised, are you? We deserve it, right? We don't like to think about that, but a nation can't be judged. Even, even the Lord's people, when a nation's being judged, they're going to be under the judgment too. And so when Elijah made this pronouncement, he knew he was in for it as well. But he was an obedient servant of God, and if you remember, he was told first to go to the brook of Cherith, and then that, and uh, he said he was going to send the ravens to feed him. Remember, and, and they did all that, and God provided for his needs. Then the brook dried up. Now I don't know uh, if you remember. This will test your memory, and you, and you can either nod or pretend. But I, I preached a message one time when the brook dries up. And see, it did. And it what was it's God's provision ending? No, it was God's provision changing. Now, we're okay. You know what mankind likes? We like stability. We like even running stuff. And when there's a bump in the road, hang on, because everybody's gonna get upset, right? And so we find that Elijah did not have that. Uh, it was smooth for a little while. And don't you know he was glad when he saw the ravens uh, coming in with another piece of bread and another piece of meat. But we know that that, well, that part of God's plan ended. And sometimes you get um, a lot of refreshing at one time and sometimes you get nearly none. And that's all under the hand of God. So with that said, and going back to our text, we get the next piece of God's plan. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, and which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now as I study and prepare and preparing, uh, I think that portion of this scripture. Uh, spoke to me more than it ever has because when he gets there she don't mention that God spoke to her but if we believe God we have to know that he did you know you think about the situation this lady was in she didn't have a husband she had a boy to feed and God says listen there's going to be this preacher man come and I want you to feed him you know, that was against her thoughts, too, wasn't it? But it didn't seem like a sound plan to her either, right? And so she doesn't mention that, oh, yeah, I heard from God. He's already told me about you coming. But she must have known it because the Word of God is true. You know, sometimes we get news about a, a plan from God that we don't like, Right? What's the impulse of man? And I believe this widow of Zarephath put it in and put it into action. Ignore it. Jump over it. Don't do it. That's the, that's the nature of mankind when it comes to things like this. And so he shows up, uh, so he rose, verse 10, and went to Zarephath. And when he came and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he prayed to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, now I want you to see again, I know that she had gotten God's message because she didn't do anything to question what his request was. You know, remember when the Samaritan woman met Christ? See, she had no, no, no idea who Christ was. You remember that in the Gospel of Matthew? And what was her first response? Who are thee that speakest to me? <laughs> I am a Samaritan. She doesn't say that. She, she doesn't give any kick because she knew God's plan. She knew exactly what was going to happen. And so she's running to get this water, which is a precious item in that day, uh, uh, something that was rare, something that there was not very much. And then he makes another request. 
in, the, in verse 11, and as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Now, I don't know exactly what a morsel is, uh, if it's a specific size. I always, when I hear a, mor a morsel, I always think of something small, and, and it, 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 it would fit in her hand. He said, Bring a morsel in your hand, and a woman's hand is even smaller than mine. So, you know what? He wasn't asking for much. But, in the very same token, he was asking for everything that she had. You know what Christ wants from you this morning? He wants everything you have. You don't hear that much from preachers, do you? He wants your money. He wants your thoughts. He wants your body. He wants everything. Jared re referred to it this morning. We're slaves. We're bought with a price. He owns us. But do we, do we act like that? And I don't think we do. And, and so we find her, him asking one more thing of her, just a small portion, a small morsel of bread. Notice her response. And she said, As the Lord liveth, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Now that was their plan, was to starve to death. Now, I want you to see, she says, I've got a handful of meal. Now, again, my hands is a little bigger than a woman's and uh, some of you have bigger hands than me but if you're just holding flour that ain't even enough to make a biscuit right you might if you put it all together with the oil maybe like something maybe that we observe the Lord's Supper with something very very small and that was her plan another thing shows you how limited her supply was two sticks was going to do the job now two sticks don't make much of a fire and it sure don't last long so the cook the cooking was going to be small and quick and that last little bit she had God wanted it it wasn't just that Elijah wanted it, God wanted it. You know what God wants here? The very last thing you have. Or at least a willingness, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I've never known him to take everything anybody's had, but I know a lot of people have had the willing heart to give it. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and so we see that he makes this proclamation, uh, request, if you will, and, and she gives him an answer, and then here comes God's plan, which, remember, she already knew. And thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Now, she was scraping the bottom of the barrel. Now, I believe she went in here. She went in there because it says it did. And uh, ladies, have you ever heard that scrape at the bottom? Uh, Donna gets really, about halfway down, Donna's at Walmart. And uh, uh, so, but what if you couldn't go? What if you didn't have any money? And you get down there all the way to the end. Now, my mother was about the opposite. It, it was gone before his mama go to the store. And I uh, used to love sweet tea. And uh, you can hear sugar scrape more than you can hear flour because it's grainy, right? And, uh, and she dusted it all up. And she followed God's plan. And she put the lid back on. And don't you know, when she got back in there and opened it again, there was some more in there. But we never said it filled back up. 
Never says that at all. You know what? I think she scraped it every time. You know, when you're scraping the bottom of the barrel, you're trusting God. You're not trusting yourself anymore. You're scraping the bottom of the barrel. It's good for you to be there. It's a good place for us to learn, to understand and find the provision of God. You know, we look at our churches in the modern day, and many, many, many of them are just shrinking like this. You know what? They're scraping the bottom of the barrel, and it's okay. Why do we get upset with God's plan? He said the end cannot come lest there be a great falling away first. You know what? It's hard sometimes. You go into churches, and I've been there, and two, three old women be all that's there, and it's hard to look at, but you know what? That means Christ is coming. Why do we get upset? Scraping the bottom of the barrel. Now, spiritually, it's hard. Physically, sometimes it's hard. Uh, looking about the room, I guess... Uh, Brother Justin's our youngest man, 15, 16, 16. And uh, uh, the rest of us are way past that, <laughs> right? That's scraping the bottom of the barrel, right? When we built the building, my father-in-law was in his 60s then. He came up these hills with two by fours just like everybody else did. You know, in man's eyes, we, uh, we were scraping them off. Uh, I'm sure people went by like, look at those people working that old man to death. <laughs> but he was still giving. You see what I'm saying? My boys were kids then. They was right on the top, putting, uh, putting plywood on the roof with the rest of us. Was that scraping the bottom of the barrel? Or was that teaching godly men how to work? You see what I'm saying? Scraping the bottom of the barrel is needful sometimes so that we can learn the provision of God. And on a spiritual sense, we've all been to churches and you hear, oh, and you, you know, they go, poor, poor old Brother McCoy, I loved him dearly. But no matter where he started, he ended up on predestination. He could be talking about uh, the widow's barrel and somehow, at the end, he would be talking about a particular redemption, and he, and he was very good at it. You know what that was? And about the 50th time you've heard it, it was the widow's barrel. And it's good. Now, I like biscuits, but I think after three and a half years of them, I get a little burnt out, don't you? And this wasn't even a good biscuit. The provision of God is sometimes bland. You ever wonder why these me mega churches are doing so well? They're preaching a false gospel first, first and foremost. And secondly, they have gobs of entertainment. That, that, that's why they're successful. We need to understand it's okay to be at the bottom of the barrel and whatever God's provision at the bottom of the barrel is, let's take it. Let's use it. Let, let's be glorifying in him. That is what God's people ought to do. Now, go with me uh, to the book of Jonah. We're just going to read a couple of verses there. Jonah chapter 2. And we're going to begin reading in verse 5. Jonah chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. By this point, God's man, and some people say he was saved, some people said he wasn't, some people said he was saved because God asked him to go to Nineveh and preach. Uh, some people say, no, he wasn't saved. Uh, he can make anything he wants to, to preach. And you know what? Uh, just like uh, people I know well, even my my closest friend, my wife, I know she says she's saved, but you know what? I can only know about me. So, you know, whatever known as, uh, Jonah's situation was, spiritually, I don't know. 
But I believe he learned a lesson at the very bottom. Personally, and you take this with a grain of salt because it doesn't say, I think Jonah was saved. Uh, because God spoke to him. That's, that's my own opinion. Take it for what it's worth. Verse 5, he's now in the sea. Remember, he instructed the shipmasters on the ship that he was on going in the wrong direction to throw him overboard, and they, they finally complied with his request, and the sea calmed down, and now he's sinking, and which direction is he going? He's going down. Now, we've all been swimming, and we all, uh, I love to swim. I can't do it that good anymore. Uh, got a little age on me, but you know what? Uh, I, I've jumped off uh, bluffs at, uh, at uh, the, in the river at Cumberland City, and I never felt the bottom. And, uh, uh, but we find that Jonah was thrown over the side. You know what? We get in bad situations, even the redeemed, don't we? You know what? When you get out of the will of the Lord, you know what's coming? If you don't make it right quick, you're going to get thrown overboard. Does that mean God hates you? No. In fact, it means he loves you. He's correcting you. He's wanting you to stay out of harm's way. Right? And, and, and so we find that uh, he, uh, he'd been thrown overboard. In verse 5, the waters come past me about even to the soul. And again, I want you to see this is a spiritual event occurring. Even to the soul, the death closed round about me, the weeds wrapped around my head, I went down to the bottoms. He was out of, out of resources. He was out of ideas. He was out of things that he could rely on himself. He was at rock bottom. A saved man, I think, at the rock bottom. You know what? We can so abuse God, so neglect truth, that the redeemed can find themselves right at rock bottom. We, we somehow convinced ourselves that that's a, a place exclusively for sinners. I don't believe that. We can be at rock bottom too. And, and so we find... <clears throat> that Jonah had done a lot of things to get here. He had rebelled against God's plan. He was glad. Now listen, this is, this is his, and this is the modern day Christian, it's me sometime. He was glad Nineveh was going to be judged. And in fact, when they had a great revival, as the Bible says, he got mad about it. Remember that? But I want you to see, we're to be, we ought to be compassionate enough to see that. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, and the, and the earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. Now, again, this is my idea concerning Jonah's soul situation. How can you remember something you don't know? If he didn't know the Lord, he wouldn't remember him. He'd have met him, right? I remembered the Lord. So we find, we find an exclusive thing, something very extraordinary and good. At rock bottom, you can find the remedy to all your problems, and that remedy to your uh, all your problems, your dissatisfaction, your your boredom, your your lack of zeal, that can be found at rock bottom. And Jonah certainly found that. He said, "Then, then I remembered the Lord." Sometimes he takes us there for the express purpose that we will remember how good he is to us. And Jonah did. 
The rest of verse 7 says, And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. What a wonderful, uh, a wonderful preaching, a wonderful text to falsehood. Lying vanities. You know what vanity is, me telling you how good you are. Oh, you're one of the best ones I've ever met. I know you're saved. I don't know about myself sometimes. Right? That's vanity. Oh, if you just be baptized, everything will be all right. You know what that is? It's vanity. It, it, it's pushing the flesh. And certainly, we don't need that. And, and Jonah finally figured that out at the, at the floor of the sea, about as deep as you can go, Jonah was learning some things he didn't know before. Verse 9, but I will sacrifice unto thee, unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. Now, why don't you, what don't you have when you're at the bottom of the sea? Well, you can't have fire because it's wet, <laughs> right? You can't have a sacrifice because of nobody down there but you. So he said, I'll give you thanks. I'll, I'll lift up your name. Can you imagine that? Thank you, Lord, for putting me in this whale's belly at the floor of the sea. See, that's learning something. Rock, rock bottom, and he was praising God for it. That, that's significant. That's how, uh, that, that's how these trials in our life ought to work. That's how they ought to run. That's how they ought to be. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. You know what uh, I promised to do the day I was ordained? I promised I'd hand it back if I, if I quit believing what I believed. See, I don't know what, I'm assuming there was no ordination process in that day. I don't know. But he said, I'm going to get back to it. I promised God I would preach, and I'm going to get back to it. That's a good lesson learned at rock bottom, isn't it? We need some time just to get back to it, don't we? At rock bottom, look, we need to begin to preach and to lift up the name of the Lord and, 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 to, and, and to praise Him for who He is. Salvation is of the Lord. He learned about sovereignty, didn't he? He learned that he had contributed nothing. He learned that all his ministry was in and of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. And so we find uh, there's a lot of good things about hit, hitting rock bottom. Now, you think about our little building. Where's rock bottom in this building? That's in the basement, right? About as low as you can go. What do you think it'd feel like? Thankfully, we've got a good floor. What do you think it'd feel like to fall through this floor and hit that concrete underneath? And I know how thick that concrete is. It's like this. It's going to be painful, ain't it? Good way to break some legs, I think. Especially, got a little age on them like I do. So that tells me hitting rock bottom is not without trouble. It's not without pain, but there's something to be learned. Now, the good thing about hitting rock bottom in this building, and I know because we went as high as we could with our eye beams, from here to that floor is 14 feet. The space between it is almost three feet. And that's a long drop. Now, the good thing, there is a bottom. 
When I was a boy, and I think I told Brother Jody about this last week, maybe the week before, I used to love Golden Caves when I was a kid. Dumb, dumb hobby. But I loved it. And then over at the Bluffs of Carlisle, there's a little wedge, and you can look and see it if you go by there, but don't look too long or you'll, you'll hit the bluff. Uh, but I knew there was a cave in there because my brother James had told me about it, so I got the big idea. It means the boys are hung with, we're going to go down there. And we got an 18 foot rope, and I started climbing down. I, 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 would, I could really, I was a lot thinner, I'll put it that way. <laughs> And so we, I was going down the rope at the knots and got to the end of the 18 foot rope and I looked at the back and I said, well boys, it don't look up, but it's about five feet. I said, I'm gonna turn loose. And I did. And I dropped 12 foot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, believe it or not, I landed on my feet, but man, they stung for days. <laughs> but you see the problem. But you know what, it could have been, since I had no sense of, I thought I knew it, but I really didn't. What if it had been 20 feet? What if it had been 30 feet? Well, you guys have never met me, <laughs> right? Now, while, there, while the bottom may be real, real far, there's a, there's a worse situation to be in. Go, uh, go with me to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. And you'll see the worst situation that you can be in. Revelation chapter 9 in the first verse. Revelation chapter 9 in the first verse, the Bible says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given a key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, here's the problem, lost friend, going where there is no bottom where you keep falling and falling and never stop the bottomless pit. That's a horrible place to be, is it not? At least if you hit bottom, you know you're there, right? I hollered at my buddy and I said, I need some more rope. All right? You know what, they got me out because I'd hit rock bottom. And believe me, it does the limestone bluffs. You know we're at the bottom of this? It was limestone. Mm. But I got out, you see. There was a bottom. You know what? I've seen pitiful poor sinners fall the entirety of their life. Haven't you? Just when you think it couldn't be any possible worse, Maybe you see him again after 10 or 15 years and you just have to walk away and shake your head. You know what? They're still falling. And, it, and, and, and there's no catch for them. They're, 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 there's no stopping. And you know what? They'll continue to fall and when they die, they'll fall some more. That's the position of a lost person. You ever wonder, you know, you think, man, why don't that person straighten up and quit drinking? You know, I've seen even friends, friends I grew up with, just orange, literally orange with liver failure and keep drinking. You know why? They're falling and there's no stopping them. And, and so we see as the Lord's people, we need to, we need to be very cautious and, and we need to be very realistic that it's okay to hit bottom. It's a good thing to hit bottom. Now, go with me to Revelation chapter 20 now, and we're going to close. They opened the pit, and we find in verse 20, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. 
And he laid a hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, we find these individuals going into the bottomless pit. And they're there a thousand years. And the best of my understanding, they were still falling. Yeah. A thousand years and still falling. Now, have you ever wondered, now, I believe the lost, if I understand the revelation correctly, just two chapters over, or maybe, no, maybe later on in that chapter, verse 14, it said the lost would be cast into the lake of fire. I think it's separate from the bottomless pit. But have you ever thought about a lake, a lake with no bottom? I've heard of, or at least the bottom ain't been found. Now, over at Cumberland City, I don't know as well at Dover, but over at Cumberland City, where the ferry crosses the river, you know where the bottom is? 40 foot down. That's the height of a two-story, uh, four-story building. That's a long way down. But you know what? There is a bottom. Dessa, when I was out visiting Dessa and Matthew one time, she showed me this lake, it's beautiful. You, you cross it going to their, where their little town is. And she said, Brother Larry, nobody's ever been to the bottom. Gorgeous, gorgeous lake. And nobody's been to the bottom. I kind of think that the lake of fire will be like that. No bottom, you just keep falling and falling, and falling, and falling some more. Scary, isn't it? Scary, isn't it? You know, I told y'all I used to jump off in the river over home. And you know, when you go down that deep, the, if you've got any brains, the very smartest thing you do, as soon as you can, you start swimming back up, right? You don't lounge around down there and wait. As soon as you go, whoosh, you start, you start swimming back up. And why? Well, the water's deep. You know, hell is deep, y'all. It's a scary place. Hmm. It's, uh, you know, just as surely as I can't imagine the glories of heaven, I cannot imagine the misery of hell. Sometimes it gets a hold of me just that much. And you know what? It makes my heart tremble. If you're at bottom this morning, I point you to Christ. You know what? If you're saved and at the bottom, learn your lesson and get your buddies to throw the rope down. You know? If you haven't learned your lesson, the best thing you do is stay right where you're at. Right? And before you leave here, I want you to consider the bottomless lake. Because, dear friend, it's a reality like we can't get a hold of in this feeble fleshy mind. I don't want you to be there.